episode 24 with Eli Schmidt. Welcome to Men of Abundance, the podcast for those looking to level up their lives by hanging out with some of the greatest leaders and established professionals in our community, living a life of integrity, honor, and the abundance mentality. Prepare to pay it forward with your host, former army medic turned lifestyle entrepreneur, Wally Carmichael. Aloha, Men of Abundance. This is already a long show, so I am going to get right into it, introduce you to Eli, because there is so much information in this conversation between myself and Eli that I want to make sure that you hang on to every piece of information. You may even want to go back and listen to this one twice, because we really get deep into a couple different categories that are going to greatly enhance your ability to live an abundant lifestyle. Our guest today, Eli Schmidt has been a personal trainer for the last 10 years. Eli is a pro muscle model and bodybuilder. He's a real estate investor and entrepreneur. And the way he got into the health and fitness industry is absolutely going to blow your mind. Wait until you hear this story. Eli, welcome to the show. Thanks, Wally. Glad to be here, man. Good. And am I pronouncing your name correctly? Yep, yep. You got it. Awesome. Perfect. Yeah, so um, I appreciated you contacting me, man. I mean, uh... You know, all the efforts that I do with the podcast, I'm often wondering if, if I'm searchable, if anybody's out there, you know, able to find me on iTunes and Stitcher and all the other stuff that's going on that, I, that I'm putting the podcast on. I know people are going to my website because I have Google Analytics on that and it's, you know, in several different countries. But when you contacted me, I was like, man, where's this guy? You know, con- a few people contact me once in a while and I always ask, where did you find me? So I can, you know, know where I'm hanging my, you know, pinning up my little digital uh, business card, if you will. Yep. So exactly. And really, me, so. you know, it was, uh, more than anything, I'm, I'm a podcast junkie. So I'm constantly trying to find, uh, you know, new sources that I can learn from and draw value from. And for you in particular, your, just the name of your podcast is what drew me to, you know, click on it and give it a listen because, um, I mean, that's, that's what I'm striving to be. And those are the type of people that I try to surround myself with men of abundance uh, and I definitely think in this time and age that, you know, if we can, and this is where I really try to focus, um, you know, to have my greatest effect on people is the men in our generation, not that the women and children need to be neglected, but I'm a firm believer that if we can affect men in our world, that that will trickle down and they will treat their women better and their family better, their kids better, and then ultimately we'll, we'll you know, the world will grow up to see, you know, better people in general. If we can kind of start at the men, um, you know, women and mom, moms, they're wonderful. Generally, in most cases, they're around in children's lives. Men's men, we can't say the same for. Um, so I think I love what you're doing, man, with your podcast. And I definitely think you're on the right track there. Brother, I really, really appreciate that. That means a lot to me by you saying that. And I, I totally agree, and that's why, as you probably know, you may have listened to my first episode is, you know, if you fix a man, you fix a family, you fix a family, you fix a community, you fix a community, you fix a town, a city, a state, a nation, and ultimately the world. Uh, oh, I love that. It's a, huge, it's a huge thing on my shoulders that I've put on myself here, but I absolutely resonate with that, and I love it. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And I haven't actually listened to your podcast. I should go back and do that because that's that's my mindset exactly. So I'm glad we're talking. Yeah, definitely start with uh, episode 000 so you'll get an idea of where I'm going with this. Things have changed since I uh, recorded that first episode. Uh, for instance, I'm not a four-day-a-week podcast anymore. I'm a three-day-a-week podcast. And, you know, a few things change, and I'll probably do, you know, re-record that later. But before we get too much into the in, into uh, the conversation here, I like to start off the podcast the way I start off my morning, which is an attitude of gratitude. So what are you grateful for today? Um, you know, it's also funny you say that because I do the exact same thing. Uh, I'm real big into morning rituals, which we'll get into that a little bit later. Um, but one of the first things that I do when I wake up is I put on my headphones. I have some good, you know, calming music that I put on. No lyrics or anything. It's going to be distracting. Um, I sit in a comfortable position. I'd only, you know, I wouldn't say it's so much meditation. Um, it's more of just kind of quiet time with God and more so just pure gratitude. And that's how I start off every single morning. So, um, you know, what I do, and and this is kind of the way, the way that I do it every morning is I'll sit there and 
you know, I always start off with my wife. Um, she is my pillar. She's, you know, literally everything that I do is, uh, you know, for her, with her in mind. She's my number one. So I just sit there and I start off thinking of just her and oftentimes I'll think back from like the day prior or the night before and think of just a certain smile that she may have had that day or something that she said or something that she did, um, you know, just little things. Um, you know, so I would say my, my wife, I am, I'm so grateful. She's extremely beautiful on the outside, but one of the very few people that, I mean, as beautiful as she is on the outside, she's even more so on the inside. So first and foremost, man, um, I would say I'm most grateful for my wife. I don't know what I'd be doing without her. Amazing. Yeah, amazing. And I feel exactly the same way. Mm -hmm. 24 years of marriage and I would be a lost boy or who knows where in the world I would be. Hey, it's scary to think about, isn't it? <laughs> it, it? It truly is. It truly is based on where my path was going anyway. Um, yeah, so let's get a little bit more into into your background and you know, kind of where you come from. Work a little bit up to what you're doing now. Don't get too much into it. We're going to talk about that later in the show, but I really want to kind of get personal and and get to know you a little bit more. Let's introduce you. Absolutely, yeah. So, um, you know, my uh, my background um, is kind of all over the place. Uh, I, I, I never knew what I was going to end up doing. Um, I grew up, I was born in Phoenix, Arizona. I lived there till I was eight. Uh, but I considered that I grew up in southern Indiana. When I was eight years old, uh, my dad's job moved us out to southern Indiana in uh, Evansville, very, very, very southern tip right next to Kentucky. Um, and we lived there, and I was definitely uh, an overweight kid. I was a chubby kid. Um, I wasn't into sports or anything like that. I actually, you know, I think just from, you know, we had a lot of stereotypical jocks at our school. And with me just being overweight, you know, I would go into gym class and would literally be the last kid running our laps every day. I, you know, would pretty much fail every physical fitness test that we had um, growing up. So I just kind of from an early start got a bad taste in my mouth for the jock mentality in athletics and things like that. And, um, you know, I was into art and music and, um, you know, I was just kind of a loner. I was never really, uh, you know, I was an average student, but never was you know, just like I said, into sports or particularly good at grades. I was just kind of like doing my own thing. I'd go to school and I'd come home and hang out. Um, but it really wasn't until I was eighth grade, in eighth grade, and I remember that particular moment when I stepped on the scale in my mom's bathroom and I was like 200 pounds. Um, and for an eighth grader, that's, that's excessive. And I wasn't particularly tall either. Um, but I remember that moment when I was 200 pounds. And it was kind of funny because um, – my friends from school, my few friends that I did have, we all decided to get an instrument and, you know, start a band one day. And I picked, randomly just picked the drum set. And so I uh, saved up some money, had my parents help me out, and I got a drum set. And uh, just started playing the drums, again, by myself or with my friends, mostly by myself. Um, after school, for four hours a day, I would just put on some headphones and just taught myself and just try and play what I was hearing. So after about two or three months of that, playing four hours a day, you know, double bass pedal and, you know, drumming my butt off, literally, I had lost 50 pounds. And it was just a matter of like three months. I dropped 50 pounds purely by accident. Um, didn't just change anything playing, with my Just by playing drums? Literally, just by playing drums. I didn't change anything. Maybe <laughs> it's because I also was drums in a sauna or something like that? <laughs> it, it was humid Indiana, so just about. But, man, four, out, wow. four hours on that kit every day and, you know, I, uh, now that I'm a little bit older and, you know, my neighbor has drums and I mean, you can hear that over the whole neighborhood right now. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, I can't believe my parents, they never once told me not to, you know, <laughs> like they just let me play that four hours a day. Um, so thank God for that because it, it literally, I mean, I accidentally got in shape. So thankfully, you know, going into high school, then I was, you know, a lot slimmer and gym class started getting a little bit easier for me and um that's where i kind of started seeing like huh like i can change my body because i mean prior to that you know as a kid you don't feel like you have any control over life your parents tell what to do school tells you what to do um 
you know, you just kind of look the way you look unless you're naturally athletic or, you know, good at some sport or something like that. So that was really my first kind of insight to, you know, hey, I have the ability to change something with my body that I don't like. And, you know, and I definitely didn't like being overweight. I actually remember crying myself to sleep one night when I was probably about fifth grade because I really didn't like my legs. I guess I had like cankles back then, you know, where I had like mm-hmm. fat lower legs. And, uh, um, I remember the next day it was like summertime and I was going to wear shorts or wanted to wear shorts. And I literally remember crying myself to sleep one night just because I was embarrassed about my legs. So that was a big deal for me when I accidentally, um, got in shape. Um, you know, kept playing the drums through high school, through bands and stuff like that. And then, um, you know, when I was, when we were living in Indiana, we moved to Colorado, Denver, Colorado, where we're at now. And this is the uh, other big pivotal moment in my life. Again, purely, I say by accident, but I mean, it is, I mean, I don't believe in accidents. This is just divine intervention for sure. Um, It was my, I, my first day of school here in Colorado and um, it was second semester of junior year and I was in English class again, day one. And I sat just randomly behind uh, this kid named Dan and uh, looking back at it, for a high school kid, he was built like really, really big for a high school kid, and uh, he weight trained frequently, and he also played the guitar. So I sat behind him. We started talking about music, and um, he invited me out to come, you know, jam with him sometime. And then when class was over, he said, "Hey, man, I'm going to the rec center to lift afterwards. You want to come along?" And I had never been in a gym ever, never worked out at all. And I'm like, oh, first day of school, meet this new kid. Let's, you know, why not? Got a friend." Um, so I went with him after school that day and just didn't stop. Um, you know, we continued to live together for about another year and a half every single day after school. That was a huge part of it was having this mentor, this guy I could look up to who understood weight training and could show me how to train and what to do. Um, and having that reliability, uh, you know, accountability, more like it, accountability of someone just waiting on you at the gym. And, uh, he eventually went off to college and I had seen some pretty good results by then. And, uh, you know, I actually remember the exact moment when it was probably about four weeks after we had started lifting together where I went in the bathroom and I like flexed my bicep in the mirror and I could actually see a little bump. And I remember right when I saw that, it was like, okay, game over. I'm never stopping this. This is amazing. If I can control, you know, change my body and shape it how I want to just by working out. Yeah. Sign me up. So I was really sold at that point. Um, from that point, I, uh, started personal training. I, you know, ordered a at home study course. I just always knew, you know, college necessarily wasn't for me. I didn't, I never liked school. Again, I wasn't a bad student, but I didn't particularly like school. And my parents, uh, God bless them. They're always, my parents are so loving. I could not have asked for a better family to grow up in. Uh, my parents were very strict. Um, but with, you know, they balance that out with love and support as well. Um, and they always said, you know, they didn't care if I went to college as long as I was helping people. And that always stuck with me. So I always made sure that whatever my interests were, whatever I, you know, took a liking to, um, career wise that I was helping people in some way, shape or form. So I got certified, uh, when I was about 20 years old, maybe a little bit younger and, uh, started training and, that kind of led me to where I'm at today. So, I mean, ultimately, fitness is what, or music is what got me into the fitness industry. And, uh, I mean, for that, that's, that was huge for me. Yeah, that sounds like a new uh, in home workout program in the making right there, man. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's funny you say, I, I haven't, literally haven't even thought of that. <laughs> but that's a great idea. That may be my new business venture right there. Well, that's kind of my industry that I've been in, in the health and fitness. And that's how I got into the health and fitness was I partnered with a company that puts out all of these in-home workout programs. And there's a new one coming out, you know, every year, at least every year, every six months or something like that. But, um, but yeah, you know, I was thinking like those, um, like those, those silent drums that you hook up to your headphones and stuff like that. They're not silent, but they're not loud. You know what I'm talking about? The pads. I know exactly what you're talking about. Yeah, yeah you I had get that just one. just as much effort into those things as you could a drum set. 
Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. It's it's cardio to the max for sure. Yeah, seriously, I never even considered that. But the funny thing is, I look back at my rocker days and all this stuff, and I've never seen an overweight drummer. But then again, most of them, you know, they had other supplements that we won't talk about. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know? Creative supplements. Yeah, creative supplements there. But, but I've never, I, honestly, I've never seen an overweight drummer. And it just makes sense now. Mm hmm. You know? Absolutely. That, that's yep, amazing. That's true, man. And it's truly an amazing. Um, you know, it, divine intervention, you used my favorite term, uh, divine intervention sitting behind your buddy there that got you into weight training uh, is just the perfect thing for you. So, you know, you talked about a lot of stuff right there, and you talked about a really big kick in the gut moment, uh, you know, when you were wanting to wear shorts that day and uh, just cried yourself to sleep, and I can imagine that. I used to be that kind of insensitive guy that say, you know, fat people are lazy and all this other kind of stuff, and people with fat kids are just even lazier because they're feeding their kids wrong, and there's just so much stuff going on in people's lives you just don't understand, and to judge people on such a, uh, on, on their body composition alone without really getting into it, and that's kind of the reason why I also decided to move into the health and fitness industry when I did, because I improved my own health. People saw that and they started asking me for assistance. And it's just such a great feeling to be able to lead somebody in the right direction. And most people know what to do and they know what they need to do. But you hit another word that's paramount in that, and that was the accountability. And yes. your buddy was your accountability to you, and now you're the accountability to other people. Mm -hmm. That alone right there is what, goodness, is 90% of helping somebody and, and getting somebody to do what they know they need to do, which is eat healthier and move a little bit. Right. And, you know, I think the other thing, too, that, that helped me from the very beginning was um, I didn't necessarily go into weight training, um, you know, to try and lose weight. It was simply, you know, I, I like I, I enjoyed doing it. Um, and that's and that's something I always stress to my clients and other people that I coach and work with is whatever you're going to do, whether it's business or fitness, you have to fall in love with the process. Um, you know, with, for me, going to the gym, it's the whole you know build up to going to the gym to where it's like you know I'll take my pre workout an hour before. There's certain motivational YouTube videos that I'll watch that kind of build up to it. As I'm driving to the gym, the music that I'm listening to, the clothes that I'm wearing to the gym, the whole process, I, I love every little bit of it. And, um, you know, I, I think if you're going into it with the intention, this is like business. If you go into business with the intention of making money and that's it, it's going to take you a lot longer than you think it's going to take. You're going to get burnt out on it. You're going to get discouraged unless you truly do fall in love with the process and the struggle. Um you know, you're going to get burnt out real quick. So I think, you know, for people listening out there, when, you know, if you are considering losing weight or building muscle or whatever your fitness or life goals are, you have to fall in love with the process. Completely, completely agree, especially with the, with, on both aspects, the fitness and the business. Business, I always say, is not about money. It involves money, but business is about solving a problem right. and helping other people. And the more people you help, then the more you're going to have coming to you. And you, I tell people all the time in your workout program, I don't care what you do. If it's something you will enjoy doing and get up every day and do it, I don't yep. care what it is. I don't care if it's yoga, CrossFit, canoeing, paddle. I live out here in Hawaii, you know, on the on, right across from the beach, and there's paddle boarders and, you know, yeah. whatever it is, that whatever gets you moving, walking your dog, walk, you, you know, going to the park with your kid and not just sitting on the bench and watching your kid, but playing with your kids you know whatever it is that that you will enjoy doing is something that you will do for a long time to come and, and what's a good way to determine if you actually love what you're doing is you're in the middle of doing it and you look up at the clock and you're like oh my god i've been doing yoga for two hours yeah <laughs> you know or like okay i gotta pull myself out of the gym i've been here way too long um, I think that's kind of in, you know, paddleboarding, I can only imagine how much time you can kill out there before you know it. Um, so that's kind of, that's kind of a good way to determine, you know, if you love what you're doing, if, if you're, if you're doing whatever it is that you're doing and you notice it's, you know, time is flying by, keep doing that and stick with that because it's obviously something you love. 
Yeah, absolutely. That's a great point. When you when you don't realize how fast time flies, you know you're enjoying yourself. And with paddle boarding, <laughs> there's a whole other aspect of paddle boarding that gets your heart rate up is because there's turtles out here where I'm at. And sometimes you know, <laughs> a turtle will jump up behind you or a little splash. They'll flap their fin, and you think it's a shark. That gets your heart rate up super quick. So that's Imagine, a good yeah. <laughs> and it gets you moving a little faster, too. <laughs> so what are you doing what else are you doing now i mean you got i saw your website and you got your partner and you guys are uh have some other stuff going on as well yeah so um you know so i really was focusing on building my training business and i had a number of odd jobs uh, my mom is very entrepreneurial my dad always had a corporate type of job um but he always backed my mom up on whatever entrepreneur type of thing that she was doing um i definitely know that i get that drive from her um you know when i was 18 i started doing uh stone engraving i had a stone engraving business so you know like those uh, you might have a flagstone in front of your house with your address on it and like mm -hmm. uh an elk or something like that um i used to engrave those um i started doing that just because we had the equipment around the house and i learned how to do it so i started doing that when i was 18 I had a number of odd jobs, and, uh, you know, I did that, oh gosh, just odd jobs in my personal training up until just a few years ago, probably about four years ago. Um, this, was a, this was another big life-changing moment for me where my personal training business was going well, um, but there's only so many hours in the day you can train, right? And I was training like 10 hours a day, 10 clients a day. And, you know, I was getting by, I was paying my bills barely, but I did have a bunch of credit card debt racked up um, from my early 20s. Again, just trying different businesses and different ventures and, you know, things like that. Um, and I remember this day where I just came home and I'm looking at my credit card bills and I just got done training 10 clients. And I'm like, Eli, like, you're not going to get to where I know you want to be if you stay on this path. You have to find something else. And that was really, really, really a tough pill for me to swallow because I was so passionate about personal training and coaching people. But I just realized at that moment that just doing the one-on-one -on -one sessions wasn't going to, you know, make me any money. Um, and, you know, I had just uh, proposed to my wife at that point. So it was like a flip switch. As soon as I did that, I swear like a month later, this flip switched in my head where I was like, okay, you have responsibilities now. You have this woman that you need to provide for. Um, and with her, like, I want to get to the point to where she can do what she wants to do. If she doesn't want to work and wants to be a mom, fine. If she wants to, you know, do something else, cool, she can do that. But what I don't want her to have to do anything um, if she doesn't want to. Or rather, I want her to be able to do anything. We'll put it that way. Mm -hmm. um, so I knew I needed another vehicle to wealth. So... My personal training stuff, you know, when I was done training clients, I would come home and I would read about nutrition, I would read about, you know, physiology, and I was constantly learning about training. And I, I just had to tell myself, I'm like, Eli, you know enough about this stuff, put that on autopilot. If you can learn this much about training from, you know, being a fat kid turning into a bodybuilder, because up at that point, and we didn't talk about this yet, um, I started doing bodybuilding competitions. And really, that was a, that, is really what taught me, you know, determination and perseverance and really what is possible if you just work really hard over a long period of time. So anyways, um, I had decided that I needed to find a different vehicle for wealth and I was on YouTube one day and there's this bodybuilder online that I watch and his channel, Rich Piana is his name. He's this huge guy and, um, but he's not a professional bodybuilder per se. Um, he's bigger than all of them, but he's yeah, that's not where he makes his money. And in all his YouTube videos, he's constantly showing his fancy cars and his fancy house. And I'm telling myself, I'm like, all right, Rich, like, well, what are you doing? Because bodybuilding isn't making you all this money. I know it's not. And he had a video out on that particular day that I kind of flipped that switch in my mind. And it was Rich Piana's video, and it was called How I Make My Money. So I clicked on it. And he basically went into how he took his graduation money, I believe, from high school and put it as a down payment on a house. A few years later, he sold that house, took that equity that he had, and he bought some small apartment building. And basically just kept doing that and upgrading and upgrading, hold on to something for a few years, sell it, get something else, multifamily. 
And it's, I mean, it was real estate. And he's, he said, I could stop training now. I could stop bodybuilding. I could stop my supplement company. And I still wouldn't have to work ever just because of the passive income I've created through real estate. So I started looking into real estate and other successful people. And I realized that that was a common thread that the majority of millionaires out there, they have their fingers in some form of real estate or another. So I uh, really, at that point, became obsessed with learning. And that's something for your listeners that I can't stress enough. Um, you have to learn. You have to constantly be pumping information into your brain, even if it's something you're maybe not interested in. Um, I got an audible.com subscription, and that has been the absolute best investment I've ever made in myself. Um, I've had that for the past Oh uh, gosh, like five years now, um, and I listen to at least a book a week. I don't. I I'm either driving or working or doing cardio or something, but I'm never sitting down to read. So during my cardio time, during my drive time, I'm always, always, always listening to a book. So of course I did Rich Dad Poor Dad, but again, that's mostly ideas. That's not really strategy. Um, what I found eventually, though, was a Bigger Pockets podcast in their forum. And I started listening to that, and I learned about this technique called real estate wholesaling. And it was intriguing to me because I, I mean, I had fifteen thousand dollars of credit card debt back then, and my income was just enough to pay my bills. And actually, that was not even all. You know, a lot of months I would have to put bills on credit card or groceries on credit card. So I, I had less than zero month, zero dollars. Um, I didn't know anyone who was doing this. Um, so I didn't have any resources outside of just podcasts and YouTube. So I decided that real estate wholesaling was my path. Now, um, here's what that basically is. So in the real estate investing world, you have two people, motivated sellers, people who need to sell their home quickly for whatever reason. Um, you know, or it's just maybe not necessarily quickly, but there's too much to mess with and they would rather just sell it to someone for cash as is. So that could be a landlord who's 90 years old now and he's starting to liquidate some of his rentals that he's had and say he's had a renter in there for the past five years and they've trashed it. He doesn't want to mess with it. He owns a house outright. He's, he's going to be willing to sacrifice some equity just to get rid of his house. Um, another person may have inherited a property from their mother who passed on and mother was a hoarder and the house is just full of junk. Now, they have two mortgage payments that they're responsible for. They just want to be able to get as much as they can out of the house, and they want to get rid of it because they're falling behind. So all sorts of situations for motivated sellers. And then you have uh, house flippers, investors who actually come in, purchase the house for cash, fix it up, and flip it for profit. So the need, the problem lies in connecting the motivated sellers with the house flippers. Because to track down these motivated sellers, it takes a lot of marketing, it takes a lot of pounding on the pavement and making phone calls and sending direct mail. You're basically a full-time marketer trying to find these people. And people who are flipping houses don't necessarily have the time or the desire to be a full-time marketer. They are busy with their properties. So that's where a real estate wholesaler steps in. So what you essentially do is you do all that marketing, however you want to do it, and we can get into details on that later. If people want to reach out to me, I can go into that. Um, and you get the houses under contract. So you run your calculations based off of what the house is going to be worth after you sell it, how many repairs it's going to need. And again, I didn't have any repair, uh, experience estimating any of that. I just learned. Um, and then you know what a house flipper is going to want to make on his profit. So you take that out of there also. And then you basically get the house under contract for a certain price. Once you have that house under contract, you are legally allowed to assign that contract to an end buyer, that being the house flipper, the investor who's actually going to purchase the home. So you find the motivated seller, get it under contract, then sell that contract to a flipper. And it's awesome for them because they know the house is already locked up so they don't need to negotiate the buyer, the house the flipper, the house is already under contract. They know their profits are already in there. You've already estimated repairs and all they have to do is go to closing, sign the documents and they have their house. 
Now, general assignment fees that a wholesaler would make is anywhere from five to twenty thousand um, dollars. The deeper you can negotiate the price with the seller, the more profit you can make. But I always like making it a win-win-win for everybody, so I would try and leave as much skin on the table for the house flipper, and I would also try and get the house seller as much as possible for their home. So let me go into our first deal real quick because people are probably asking right now, well, I don't have money to market, I don't have time to market or anything like that. Um, after I started the company, after I watched that Rich Piana video, I knew that's what I wanted to do. So I started my company, it was called 303 Home Buyers. Uh, 303 is our Denver area code. So I created 303 Home Buyers LLC. Um, one thing about me, Wally, is I'm a chronic action taker. I will in, call it maybe a little bit of impatience, but I think it helps me out more than it hurts me. To where if I get an idea, the next day that I'm doing research, the LLC is made, and I'm ready to go. That's all easy stuff to do. Um, and it kind of keeps you accountable. You know, it's easy to come up with an idea, but if you don't create the LLC, if you don't invest that $25, you know, you don't have anything invested into it, and it just kind of dies out. It's really easy to do. So I created the LLC, but it, and just started learning, 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 learning as much as I could about the process of wholesaling and what that entailed. Um, I got on Craigslist, and I was looking at people selling their homes because, again, I didn't have any market to do any mail, marketing money to do any mailers or anything like that. Um, one day I was working at the gym training, and uh, this other trainer, his name is Sterling, he walked in there. And he was like, man, Eli, and we were only trainers at this point together. We weren't friends or anything. He's like, man, Eli, if you ever find a way to make a bunch of money without having to train all day, he's like, let me know. And I was like, hmm, actually, what are you doing for lunch? So we went out to lunch. I told him about real estate wholesaling and invited him to be 50-50 partners in the company. So long story short, a few months had passed of, again, him learning at this point and me kind of teaching him what I had learned. I was on Craigslist, and what I would do is anytime I had a chance, multiple times during the day, I would be on Craigslist, and I would search keywords like needs work, handyman special, must sell, things like that. And this house came up on Craigslist, and it, the guy who wrote the ad, he mentioned that he uh, this was a rental property that he had. He needed to move to Florida, and he was liqu liquidating all his houses. Um, he said he was asking two twenty dollars for it. So again, because he said he was moving to Florida in two weeks, I knew there was motivation there. So immediately I called him up and I said, you know, I got the situation on the house. He was asking 220 on it. Um, I set up an appointment for Sterling to go look at it. I was tied up with clients and Sterling was available. So again, I used kind of partnership to get this done fast. So I ran the numbers and I called Sterling and I said, hey, dude, we have to get this house for 180. He's asking 220. Go over there. Work your magic. So he goes over to the guy's house, um, and again, we have no experience with this at all. We have no money. We don't. We don't even know what we're doing. We're just figuring it out as we go. Um, he shakes hands with the guy at 170, um, and as he's literally mid handshake, a realtor and two couples are walking out of the house. The guy had just posted it on Craigslist in Denver, a such hot market. There were already real estate agents over at his house. And uh, he's mid handshake at 170, and the real estate agent walks out and he goes, We'll give you 220 for the house. And Sterling pipes up and he goes, Hey, but when can you close? Guy's got to move to Florida in two weeks, and they needed 30 days to close. So Sterling tells the guy, He goes, We'll give you $180,000 $180, cash. We'll close in seven days, guaranteed. And we sign the contract under those terms. Yeah. Now, keep in mind, we don't have any cash. We don't know any house flippers even who we're going to sell this to. We don't know anything. This is purely just leap of faith, you know, you know, ready, fire, aim. And uh, so Sterling calls me. He's like, hey, we got it under contract. And that phone call was amazing. But then very quickly the panic sets in like, holy crap, we have to actually buy this for $180,000 in seven days. Um, or back out of the deal. And in contracts, you always kind of build – ways out but we don't like to do that right. so we got our contract and i'm sitting there thinking that night i'm like okay now who do we know because as a wholesaler you have to assign that over to a house flipper someone who's actually going to flip the property we don't know anybody i don't have any buyers or anything like that so we start thinking i'm like okay now who do we know who wants to buy this house or would buy this house and i'm like i know that real estate agent just said he wanted to buy that for 220 or his couple right 
So this is where it gets kind of funny and creative. Again, just using resources and having faith and making stuff happen. So I talked to Sterling, and we didn't know we didn't have the guy's card, the real estate agent. We just knew his name was Adrian. So I got on Google Images. I type Adrian, real estate agent, Denver. I go to Google Images and then send all the guys that I saw over to Sterling. Had him do like a lineup, and he found, he saw who it was. He picked him out. I called him the next morning. I'm like, hey, Adrian. I said, we're, I'm Eli with 303 Homebuyers. We're the people who um, made that off, got this property under contract yesterday. I said, we'll close on this in seven days if your buyers still want it for 220 in 30 days on their timeline after they can get their loan to go through. Um, he's like, okay, let me talk to my buyers. I'll give you a call back. And I got to tell you, Wally, that two hours was the most adrenaline filled, like, <laughs> That was that was the craziest wait ever because again we hadn't done this before. I didn't know what was going to happen. So, phone rings two hours later, and he goes, "You know, hey, it's Adrian." He goes, "My buyers are ecstatic. Let's do the deal." So I had him send me over a contract at that point. So now we have a sell contract, a purchase contract from the seller to us, and then we have a sales contract from us to this other couple for two twenty. So again. We have another issue here, you and that's we don't have any cash. Days. And this isn't a typical deal because in a normal assignment deal, you just assign the contract over. You're not actually mm -hmm. buying the property. On this particular deal, because it was through an agent and these people are getting a loan, we actually have to close on it in seven days, hold on to it for a month until their loan can close. So now I'm like, okay, who do I know with money? I don't know anyone with money. My family doesn't have money. We need 180 grand cash. <laughs> So um, there was this client of another trainer that I knew. Again, we weren't friends at this point. I knew that he had his own business and he, you know, kind of understood money. And we had said hi and stuff. You know, we knew of each other. I called him and I said, you know, hey, Greg. I said, here's the deal. I said, I have this contract to buy this house for 180. I have a contract to sell the house for 220. I need $180,000 cash in seven days, six days at that point, five days probably. Um, and he was like, send me over the contracts. Looks like a good deal. Let's do it. So sure enough, seven days later, he funded the deal. It l sat there for three weeks. And then the other people came in and closed it for 220. Um, we split our profits 50, 50 with Greg, the guy who funded it. And we made 20 grand like that from a Craigslist ad. And at that point that was like, I mean, <laughs> that I hadn't made any more than like, you know, two thousand dollars at that point, and here we make twenty thousand dollars from a Craigslist ad, and a little bit of knowledge and a little bit of paperwork. And what that's did it. you? So, my so that's my long winded story of how we did our first deal. But at that point, I'm like, if I can do this deal with no experience, eighteen thousand dollars of debt, and I made twenty grand off a Craigslist deal, everybody needs to. <laughs> I mean, like anybody can do this, and that's why I became so passionate about trying to help others do this um, and find what their wealth vehicle is going to be. And it's not always your passion. For me, it's personal training and personal coaching. Um, that you know, But that wasn't creating me the wealth that I needed. So I had to seek out another vehicle that maybe wasn't my passion, um, but it was still very, very effective. Yeah, that's a very good point. And you hit the nail on the head. A lot of people are very passionate about health and fitness, but it just barely pays the bills. Most of the people that I know that are personal trainers or group trainers, they have other jobs, they have other income. It's oh, not yeah. their only income. It's not an income to sustain on, that's for sure. And uh, so my question to you as far as the real estate, did you, where did you learn how to do what you were doing? Strictly from podcasts and YouTube and reading. Um, that is that is it. And now that I'm in the scene and kind of in the industry, I know ton of people who have paid $30,000 for the Rich Dad Poor Dad programs, mm. who have paid $50,000 for other real estate programs. I mean, the, the free seminars that you see advertised all over the place, you go to those, they give you free information, but then they get you to sign up for their program, which is thirty to $50,000 generally. And then they're even upselling you at those programs. And you know, what's funny is all the people that I know, most of the people that I know that have done those programs still are just in the study mode and the learn mode and have not taken any action. So we didn't have that money, so we had to use our resources. So if you again, if you think it takes money to get into this or to learn it, you're absolutely wrong. And if you're just 
I mean, you don't even have to be creative. It's called Google and YouTube and podcast, iTunes. <laughs> no, yeah, that's that's absolutely amazing. And I, I, your assessment of Rich Dad, Poor Dad, uh, the book anyway, is spot on. It's great ideas. It's just not a whole lot of strategy. And right. I've been to the Rich Dad, Poor Dad seminars. I actually, I think, I think years ago, I must have bought the Colton Sheets program or something. But I did get into real estate, into lease options and other forms of creative uh real estate i hired a guy uh i paid him five grand to mentor me for a year and he was one-on-one mentorship gave me all his contracts gave me everything i made my money back in the first deal and it was a no money down i put no money into my first three deals none whatsoever and it was basically a lease option is kind of what you're doing without the flip so i lease a property for three to five years from the owner from a motivated owner seller and then I already have a database of uh, potential um, tenant buyers, and mm-hmm. I just put them. I just sublet the property right over to them. I make money up front from the lease option consideration. I make money over the course of the 12 months that they're in the lease, and then if they buy the house at the end, I make money on the back end, or I just renew the lease and make some more option consideration cash. And it's a win-win-win for everybody. Yeah, it doesn't money. take any special talent. It's just a little bit of education. And taking action. In fact, at the time, my son was 15 years old. He was the one doing the cold calling for me. I said, oh, here, really? <laughs> yeah. I said, here, call these numbers because he has a lot of voice. I said, here, call these numbers. This is what you say. If they say they're interested in doing a lease option, then say, okay, I'll get you in touch with my partner. And then keep their number and I'll call. And, and then I'll, you know, he set a time for them to call me that I'll call them back. And that way it was getting him some people skills and some skills to do that. And I wasn't having to do the cold calling. Oh, yeah, man, cold calling skills at 15, that's going to help him a ton. Oh, I wish yes. I had done that. Absolutely. Yeah, my, my middle son now is at, working at a Pizza Hut call center, which is an experience for him. <laughs> oh, yeah, fun yeah. times, fun for times. Sure. That's good, though. For sure. That's how you learn, man. It is, man, and I, I love all that stuff. And there's so many things that men of abundance, these are just a few more things that you can do. Personal training is not hard to get into. And if you personally, the one of the reasons why I like doing personal training, or I never really did personal training, although people asked me to, I would do group training. And it helps keep me accountable to my own health, for one thing. Uh, mm-hmm. And then, um, of course, you know, there's a little bit of extra cash in it, you know, for you. But when it's when you're talking about some sort of side hustle doing some sort of side hustle real estate really is something good to get into and i know exactly what you're talking about eli about that seven days because i've had property that i was holding on to that i had to make a payment on pretty soon until i get a, 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 a tenant buyer in there and that last five or six days is nerve wracking right but you know it 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 always seems it always seems to come through. It does. You know, it that really saying? does. Fortune favors the brave, and I think that's very, very, very true. Um, the universe and God and the world has a way of pushing you to your absolute limits. And if you just manage to stay positive and persevere and have faith, um, you're always going to come out on top. Perfect. So we got a little bit of time left, not a whole lot, but I still want to get into the pay it forward round. You ready for that? Yes, let's do it. Awesome. Let's pay it forward. So give men of abundance one to three actionable steps that they can take today. So I would say, number one, um, create a morning ritual. Now, this can be anything, you know, you don't have to do it. And there's a lot of like YouTube videos where they'll have, you know, what my morning ritual is, a bunch of different people out there. Create your own. Create something that you're going to do that's enjoyable for you in the morning. But waking up early is key. I'm always up by 4.30 or 5 every morning, even if I don't have to. Um, wake up early. Now, my morning ritual uh, goes like this. So I wake up. I go in the mirror, and this sounds goofy, but I swear this works. And I put the biggest smile on my face for at least 10 seconds. And that's a way of waking me up. You can't help but feel happy when you're smiling. I mean, you're not going to be mad and smile at the same time. So I stand in the mirror and I put a big smile on my face for 20 seconds. You're going to feel goofy doing it at first, but I swear it helps. Um, I go, I take care of the dogs, feed them, put them out, all that. And then I go upstairs. And like I said at the beginning of the podcast, I sit down and I have 10 to 20, maybe 30 minutes if I have the time where I just have quiet time with God where... Uh, you know, sometimes I pray, but I just sit there and I feel gratitude for my wife, my parents, my family, my business partners, 
certain situations, um, being on shows like this, on this podcast, um, just take that time and feel gratitude. Um, from that point, I go to the gym. I have a very intense, heavy workout, and then I hit the ground running, and I'm busy till generally 10.30 at night. So I have energy all day long, but having that morning ritual is absolutely key. So try to involve some uh, nutrition, some form of movement like exercise, and some sort of prayer or gratitude or meditation time. Um, second, I would say become obsessed with learning. Get an audible.com subscription. Never have any downtime. Like if you want to come home and watch maybe 30 minutes of TV or something when you're winding down at night, that's fine. But then get back to work on your side hustle. Fill your brain with information. I mean, in 2016, this is the age of information. There's no excuse for not knowing how to do something. I mean, you can find step-by-step programs online of how to literally do anything, create money out of nothing like I did. Um, so audible.com subscription, that's just audiobooks through Amazon. Amazing, amazing, amazing resource right there. And then I would say the third one, again, very important, uh, tithing has been a very important incorporation in my life that I've started doing, uh, very religiously lately. And even when I didn't have money, even when I didn't have credit card debt, taking 10% and giving that away to charitable organizations, oftentimes what I'll do is I will just save some up and then whenever I encounter somebody in my life who needs it, um, you know, whether it's, you know, someone on the street, rarely do I do this, but sometimes you just come across that person on the street asking for money and it just strikes you that they actually need it and that you're going to be able to help them. Um, I do give that to the, do, you know, just give them cash. Sometimes I think that's, to me, that's, you can have a lot great, you can give money to the Red Cross if you want. And who knows what happens to that money? Not saying that's bad, but who knows what happens to that money? But when you can give a mother and her three children $500 cash, she's never going to forget that the rest of her life. And the amount of impact that you can have on a stranger like that um, is quite an incredible feeling. So tithing, or if you legitimately don't have the money or you're not ready to tithe yet, give away whatever your talent is, whatever your specialty is. Everyone's been blessed with some form of talent. If you haven't figured that out yet, keep trying new things and then give that away. Try and help people out and build others up. Yes, tithing in your time, talents, or treasure. Yes, and, yes, and absolutely, absolutely. You can do one of the three. You can definitely do one of the three without a doubt. So you already mentioned some of your habits, but what other daily habits make up the biggest impact in your life? Uh, purely my morning ritual and working out through and through. And then I would just say, Momentum is huge, you know, and you can feel it whenever you go to sit down on the couch and relax, your world just kind of slows down. Um, opportunities slow down, things slow down, you know, you know, phone calls stop coming in. I don't know how it works, but I swear there's a universal momentum out there. And it's like, even if you're busy, you know, if, if I have open space in my calendar, I'm calling real estate agents just to go have lunch, even though maybe some direct you know, deal isn't going to come from it. It's just momentum. It's meeting people, just staying busy and staying moving both physically and mentally uh, is very important. That momentum, that momentum is key to carrying you through uh, to accomplishing your goals. Absolutely. Keep Mo in your life. Once you find Mo, get Mo, keep Mo. And it's true (laughs) in health and fitness as well. Everybody says it's so hard to get started, then quit stopping. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's why. Oh, man, I'm glad you said that. And I know I've been kind of rambling on here, but let me say that real quick. Never, ever, 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 ever give up. Just don't stop. Um, people will ask me, you know, friends that I see from high school that knew me back, like, when I was skinny or, or you know, even further back when I was chubby, like, Eli, like, how did you get in this shape? My one answer is I didn't stop. I didn't do anything special. You know, the only thing, I, and my diet has fluctuated up and down, but the one thing I just haven't done is stop. I just consistently have always gone to the gym and over time i mean the results are the results are there i know this is going to be hard for you because you like me have an audible subscription and i'm an avid uh, I, I gotta curb how many podcasts i've subscribed to right. because I just they're just piling up and i can't get to them all but what book would you recommend to men of abundant leaders and why so i have two books here so the first one is going to be the 10x rule by grant cardone um, one of my favorite guys, I know he's a, I know he's a little rough around the edges for some people, but I really like that. And what my favorite thing about the 10 X rule, basically the principle is 
take whatever you're doing, whatever your goals are, multiply it by 10, do 10 times the amount that you think you're going to need to do, and that's actually what it takes to be successful. And that could not be more true because um, my clients that are just starting off training, the people that I work with that are just building their business, the biggest shock factor is that people have no idea how hard it actually is to become successful or accomplish your goals. People have no idea. They severely underestimate how much work, time, and energy actually goes into creating a successful life. Now, that's in the beginning stages. Again, it's starting that locomotive. It's the amount of fuel that's required in the beginning, but after that locomotive is up and going, it takes everything to try and stop that momentum. So it takes a lot in the beginning, guys. I mean, the first five, 10 years of your business is gonna be the hardest, but then it's gonna coast after that um, it, you know, with minor adjustments along the way. Um, so don't underestimate how much it's going to take because that's you're in for rude awakening if you yeah, think. Yeah, let me add to uh, that anything. real quick. An analogy is the uh, uh, a commercial jet uses way more fuel on takeoff and way more energy than it does when it's at altitude. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So be ready for that. Yeah, be ready for that. Um, then the other book is the five language lo- the five love languages by Gary Chapman. Um, that book has made me. I mean, that's completely changed the way that I, you know, talk to and communicate with not only my wife, but my family, my extended family, business partners, everybody, my clients. Um, Basically with that book, um, read the book, but the general principle is that everyone has a different way that they love and feel love. Um, Whether that's through words of affirmation, whether that's through physical touch or gift giving, and there's a couple others. But if you can find out and discuss with your partner, you know, how they love and feel loved, you're going to be able to show them love a lot better and be able to feel a lot more love from them. And that book has, that's one that I regularly go back to. And um, especially on the audio book, we'll just have that. And if you have, if you have a wife, listen to that together. That's one, that's one way that the audio book is helpful. When we're just cleaning the house or we're laying in bed together at night, we'll have that book on frequently. And we can sit there and listen to it together and talk about it together and be like, oh, that's how you feel? Oh, well, this is how I feel. And then um, it's just that that was a game changer for our relationship. That took us to the next level for sure. Perfect. And I'll have those books listed in the show notes of this show with timestamps uh, so you can go directly to this part, part of the conversation. And that will be at menofabundance.com forward slash, let me verify that, forward slash 024. Menofabundance.com forward slash 024. Find those links. So I have one last question for you real quick before we close this up. And it's, to me, one of the most important conversations and the most important question, which is what does living a life of abundance mean to you, Eli? Oh, man. You know, I think it can mean a lot of things. But I think that, you know, generally everyone needs to focus on becoming the strongest version of themselves. So often, I mean, now is a perfect time where you can get on anywhere on social media, turn on any TV channel, and you're going to see everyone pointing fingers at everybody, blaming everyone else for whatever issues are going on in the world right now. And everyone just needs to focus on becoming the strongest and the best version of themselves. And what that means is not just making a lot of money, not just being happy, but I think there's five real big areas that we need to focus on, and that's your spirituality your romantic relationships, uh, your physical fitness, your physical training, wealth, and then your mindset, your self-development there. I think if you can break down each one of those areas, a lot of people are going to be strong in some areas and very weak in others, and focus on those weak areas and take time, do a self-evaluation, do a little audit of yourself and see where do I, which of those five pillars do I need to work on improving, and then utilize your resources, read books, you know, get online, find out how to build those areas and really focus on that. And then eventually you're going to be a well-rounded individual. And at that point, then it's time to help bring others up around you. And we don't just want abundance for ourselves. We want abundance for everyone in our circle, for our tribe, for the people that look up to us. Um, you know, and, and that's what I think life is about, is about building yourself up and in the meantime, bringing up as many people with you as possible. Absolutely. Abundance is about, not just about you, but about all the people around you. That's what abundance is all about. And that's a great answer. I love that. So leave us really quickly with a parting piece of guidance and any way that we can get in touch with you. Um, I would say take control of your mind, of your body, exercise, 
become obsessed with learning. Take chances, take action, and don't be afraid to fail. Failure is growth, just like bodybuilding. If you're not failing in the gym, you're not going to build any muscle. That's why we go through failures because it makes us stronger. So, don't not not don't even just not be afraid to fail, but actually go out and try to fail. When I'm lifting weights in the gym, I get excited when I fail at something because I know that's going to make me stronger. That rep that I couldn't do is the one that's going to make me stronger. So don't only not be afraid to fail, but go out and try to fail. Um, if people want to reach out to me, the best way right now, uh, I'm in the middle of uh, developing a new website. So email is the best uh, form of contact right now. That's Eli, E-L-I, Schmidt, S-C-H-M-I-D-T, CPT, Certified Personal Trainer at gmail.com. Um, I have a YouTube channel, youtube.com slash mindmusclemoney. If people are wanting to learn how to get in shape, develop their mind, um, create wealth, I give tips for all of those on my YouTube channel, Mind Muscle Money. Um, if they want to look me up on Facebook under Eli Schmidt, uh, that's good as well. And then one thing I want to throw out there to your uh, listeners, I'm huge on self-development, personal coaching, um, like I said, real estate is a wealth vehicle for me, but my passion truly lies with inspiring others. So for any of your listeners, if they want to reach out to me, shoot me an email, hit me up on any of my social media uh, platforms. Um, I'll do a free Skype consultation with people, and I call it a consultation, but rather it's, uh, it's a personal audit. Let's talk about life. Let's talk about your goals. We'll lay out a quick little blueprint to get you there. Totally free of charge. I just like helping people and getting in touch with others. Perfect. Men of Abundance, definitely take him up on that. Any time that you can get in front of an influencer like Eli, face-to-face, on Skype, it, it's just an amazing, amazing experience, and it will change your life. So get it. every time you get a chance to do that with anybody, take that opportunity and do that. It will enhance your life without a doubt. Eli, it's been a pleasure. I definitely have enjoyed this conversation. There's so much that we have um, shared with Men of Abundance, and... I, it's just my hope that two guys take action today. <laughs> well, Wally, I appreciate it, man. And uh, again, uh, I look up to you for what you're doing. Keep pumping out the great content, man. And uh, I hope to be back on sometime in the future. Absolutely, without a doubt. All right, take care, man. Bye-bye. That's all for today, Abundance Leaders. For more about our guests and the powerful information we shared with you today, be sure to sign up for our mailing list at menofabundance.com. We appreciate your time and look forward to hanging out with you on our next episode. So until then, be sure to pay it forward and live your life of abundance.